Feinstein. It is my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Clancy. My name is Clancy Emmis London. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm very glad to be here this afternoon in dreaded Marin County and uh, seeing what the yuppies are up to. I want to uh, express my thanks to Jack C. and his charming bride for coming to the airport. I know Mary probably meant to, but it slipped her mind in her self-obsession. But... Uh, her eagerness to get to her funny little talk, but <laughs> thank you. And for your tour of all the local restaurants that are closed. <laughs> I thought a depression was to hit the area. There's one over here. <laughs> oh, they're close too, son of a bitch. <laughs> we finally found one that was open, but the kitchen was closed. I'm uh, glad to be here and see some old friends and new friends. I see uh, my friends Bill and Jan Y. from the area. I spoke in this very hall. Bill reminded me about that ten years ago. What was that for, Bill? I'll do the talking. You just give me a... <laughs> hey, um, just a simple declarative answer will be sufficient. I'll, I'll do the background material. And uh, Bill knew how to treat a visitor. I'm sorry to say that the current administration doesn't. I, when, I, when I got, when I pulled, when they pulled up in front, there's a sign out there, a big signboard. It said, Welcome Clancy I. And I looked, I so looked forward to seeing it today, and it said, Aerobics Classes. <laughs> I guess when you get old, they forget you. <laughs> I, uh, I want to really commend Mary. That was a fine talk. I told her when she got done. That was as, she sounded as well as I've ever heard her sound. And she talked good about the emotions we all face, drunk and sober. And she is a good example of, a, as she often, often says, she's a good example of a woman alcoholic who walks in dignity, which is about all we can ask out of this uh, cruel world. I want to thank Tom for his excellent talk. He did a lot. I, when he, I did have a tear in my eye when he told me about his sad childhood, but I, I, I choked it back somehow. Maybe we start a new group, adult children of people living at Hunter's Point. <laughs> and I want to uh, thank Carol for a fine talk, because she's a charming young lady. Is there anyone else I should acknowledge? I want to acknowledge Bart, so if you don't acknowledge Bart, your tapes don't come out. Uh, <laughs> And I guess that's about it for today, and uh, thanks a lot, and we'll see you all next year. <laughs> now, just a joke, you pukes down there. You know, they got, boy, that was a good one. Huh? I, uh, I've had kind of a uh, uh, big week. Uh, some of you know that I was supposed to a talk at the, for Frank Brennan down in the Longshoremen's Club last Sunday night. And uh, I got a phone call Saturday that my mother had passed away in Wisconsin. So I had to cancel out. Then I went back to Wisconsin. I spent much of the week uh, in Wisconsin burying my mother and arrange, making the funeral arrangements and such things. And uh, it sounds sad to say my mother passed away, but it really was a blessing. It was a deal where I was up there quite a bit recently to see her and, and the last time I was there she didn't even recognize me and she was just in pain and sick so when she passed away it really was a pleasant thing it is always a little drag I'm sure most everyone has to go through it sooner or later but I never have had to of going in to pick out caskets and things like that that is a 
And I I couldn't even bear the idea of it, but it's like so much AA tension. You just go do it, and you got in there, and the guy was a nice guy, and didn't even think about it after, you know. But just the concept of the casket room scared, or not scared me, but made me feel bad. But it's like so many things, you just go do it. And then we had a nice funeral, and Wednesday afternoon we we uh, buried my mother in a little country churchyard out in the country. Just the sort of thing you see in a postcard with grass and trees and rolling fields and the little country church across the road and birds singing. And I really felt just tremendous when I when the funeral was over. And I, uh, I remember getting on the plane and coming home. I had to drive back to Minneapolis kind of helter-skelter to... Because I wanted to be at my home group that night because that's uh, my home group was, and other me- meetings like that enable me to walk through such things with some degree of ability and security, things that of myself I cannot do. And then I tried to do a, about a day's work yesterday and then yesterday or Thursday and then yesterday we had a guy was killed right outside my desk or outside my office, was stabbed to death and another guy was killed in the corner and just on and on back to reality and then I had a I told a friend of mine that I would uh, help him start his new little group he didn't have any money to speak of so I just I'd, I'd swing it around so I was down in Phoenix last night and it was hot and ishy and I was looking forward to coming up here today and and I'm here and uh, after I got here I was here about an hour the pressure went down and I feel good and felt good all day and it's been a most uh, pleasant day and Mary's good AA talk centers me again as a good AA talks do and I'm looking forward to a pleasant uh, evening I'm go home and my my little grandson and granddaughter are visiting at the moment and uh, I'm going to need all my stability for that (laughs) I love them but Jesus you know when you've raised a family and you get a little taste of freedom and then here it comes again, you know. I loved I, those little kids. I give them nice presents. I say, here, here, John. Remember, I love you more than your other grandpa does. Uh, but he's only about 14 months old, and he, can't, he doesn't realize what I'm doing for him. And he just walks around, and I, maybe some of you have the experience. We were talking about it at lunch. You... You, uh, of setting anything down, anything down, it's gone. You know, you just, John, when are you going to be able to, when are you going to be old enough to talk and tell me where you put those goddamn car keys? You know, I can't wait much longer, six months maybe at the outside, you know. (laughs) But I, I don't complain. The, uh, but it's part of, the ongoing process of living. In fact, I was thinking, I was telling someone last night, it's a funny thing, how you, the thing you get into. Do you remember a few years ago that song that was very popular? I hadn't thought about this forever. You know, the song, Alone Again, Naturally. One of the great self-pitying, <laughs> Alone Again, Naturally. <laughs> and if you listen to the lyrics in that song, the guy's got to be in his late 40s or early 50s describing what he's because he's gone through these things for many years and you suddenly think here's this guy crying because uh, his mother or father has has died and he's in his late 40s and he's left alone and you think what how would a dummy you know it's going to happen but I was thinking about that in the last 14 or 15 months my father's died and my sponsor has died and my mother's died and I caught myself thinking just a little bit of the plane to Minneapolis the other night. Uh, you know, who's going to take care of me? You know, who do I, who have I got to lean on? And then you've got to remember, that's what life's about. That you, uh, we take turns being leaned on. The people ahead of us, we lean on them. Then it gets to be our turn. The people behind us lean on us. And we would like to, but there's a little residual thing in me, and I presume in most of us, who still would like to find some warm lap to crawl into sometimes and uh, explain why it isn't my fault. (laughs) But when you get wrinkled and bald, those laps get harder and harder to find. (laughs) 
And uh, I, like most of you, have much of my life found the solution to that problem was having a few drinks. And a few drinks has always been able to uh, help me a great deal. It tides me through. It gets me, it gets me through difficult times. It replenishes parts of my spirit that seem to have either atrophied or never grown to full growth. It seems like in my personality there are things that do not have not been matured or something. And year time after time in my life I've fallen into a trap. And I used to I never even recognized the trap for twenty five years. And then I, I was sober a while and got listening to people's fifth steps. I heard them talking about it. I thought, oh yes, I've fallen into that trap. And then since then I've worked in corporate situations. I've seen president of corporations. And all everybody fall I've come to the conclusion everybody falls into the trap. People like us fall into it the most because it happens to you when you're feeling insecure, when you're feeling alienated. And people like us, of course, that's a symptom of our illness as intermittent insecurity and alienation. But that trap is when you're feeling bad or feeling less than or feeling different or feeling a little left out, to start just looking around you to see what it is they've got, you haven't got, and how you can feel better and why you are different, and why you are feeling estranged. And you don't even think why it is. And there's nothing wrong with those comparatives, and we've all done it sometimes. There's only one thing wrong with it. The answer you get is always wrong. And the reason the answer is always wrong is because you never stop to consider at such a time, I am comparing my insides against their outsides. I am comparing my raw meat against defense mechanisms they've spent 30 years building to conceal their raw meat. So as a result, when you're feeling insecure or feeling less than or feeling alienated or feeling different and you look around you, I can almost guarantee you that you will never see anyone who looks as sensitive as you feel. (laughs) You will never see anyone who seems to feel the type of anxiety that troubles you. They have anxiety, but it's kind of a superficial anxiety. (laughs) They don't have a deep-seated anxiety. And if they do have a deep-seated anxiety, they know why they're anxious, which would help you a great deal. A lot of times in my life I thought, Jesus, I, I guess I must have a lot of anxiety, but I don't know what it's about. I can't find enough reason at the moment to justify this much anxiety. And it turns out that it's quite a common thing amongst people like us. We call it the sense of impending doom. As you go through life, you just, what's wrong? Nothing so far. (laughs) You just, something's going to be happening. I think it's safe to say that when you're feeling that way, you will never see anyone who seems to be as insecure as you feel. As not sure of what you want to do. See, other people know what they want to do and go do it. And I, I have an entire committee that sits in session every time there's a decision to be made. And they all gather from all over. Okay, what do we do? Piece of shit out of me? What do you think we're going to do? <laughs> but whatever you do, whatever action you can, whatever action you take, they'll vote unanimously. No, that wasn't it. <laughs> They never want to tell you beforehand, but they tell you afterwards. <laughs> As I've said many times in AA, I've always been amazed by alcoholics who want to go into group therapy. I, uh, I just go for a ride alone in my car, Christ. <laughs> what do you think about that? You know, that's, that's a good point, yeah. You'll never see anybody who seems to resent injustice injustice as much as you do. Sure, other people resent injustice, but they're all wimps. They say, oh, go along, just play the game. But I want to... I've been a fighter for justice forever. A lot of young whelps in the last 10 or 20 years think they're the first generation who ever fought for justice. I fought for justice before it was cute. I've stood on the barricades of life in my little way and 
justice. We demand justice for all mankind. And like people today, we also said, if there's not enough to go around, I'll take mine and screw them. <laughs> you know. If there are any of you who are currently fighting for justice, let me tell you something. As you get a little bit older, you re your cry changes. After a while, you don't cry out for justice anymore. You start crying out, mercy, <laughs> mercy. I've had all the justice I can handle for this lifetime. Because it turns out justice is not the way I want things to be, but justice the way they want things to be. And that's unjust. But the more you compare these things, and you more to do these things, the more efforts you make to compare to see why you're alienated makes you more alienated. It's a funny thing. A lot of people, there's an awful lot of people in this world who have a lot of trauma. They don't drink, they don't show it much. But you see them trudge around. They go from TA to TM to S to all these things, primal therapy. I'm not putting any of these things down. Because they're, they're people seeking things. And I'll tell you something else. Most people in these groups, if you ever talk to anybody in any one of these organizations, this is not their first organization. They were in another one before that, and another one before that. And it worked for a while, and then it burned out. Then they went to another one. And it worked for a while, and it burned out. And on and on. Well, uh, Tim, are you going to walk up and down all afternoon? Are you going to sit down and... Sake. Yeah. You'll live forever on this tape, Tim. <laughs> Just think, years from now, in a group far away, newcomers will be sitting around saying, what did he mean by when he said Tim? <laughs> Most of us struggle with a... And we all can talk about emotions. We all know about our feelings. And we have our rages and our loves and our hatreds and all the things. But what it boils down to, you know, even all those emotions might be satisfactory. But I was thinking about this a few years ago. When you get down to the bottom, if every so often, you just felt good. But my natural feeling is not feeling good. My natural feeling is a kind of a low, ongoing feeling of unease. Just, this is not quite it either. And uh, people don't like to live like that. And you and I have been singularly blessed... We have found a socially acceptable way to beat it and a way that doesn't work for 93% of the people. Just think, those people out there have no solution. Oh, they have solutions, but it's... And some of them feel as bad as you and I do. It's, it's a funny thing when you think about it. The uh, various medications you and I are tempted by in moments of stress and our doctors would like to have give to us the Valiums, the Libriums, the Secondals, the various things. These were designed for people who have feelings just like yours and mine. They're not designed to cure them. They're designed to nullify them temporarily chemically. Because... Here's a funny thing. There are millions of people who feel the way you and I feel to one degree or another who are not alcoholics. And there's, they are called medically acute or intense neurotics. They are people who see reality as it is but react to it badly and emotionally and obsessively. And their life is just one thing after another and they're just always trying to find it, put it together. And they work fiendishly, and they run to Reno and Las Vegas. They do this, and they do all sorts. They get active in church work, all sorts, everything they can do. Just they don't even know, never an identification what's wrong, but just something, something's wrong. And they go to doctors, and they go to psychiatrists, and doctors prescribe 
these sedatives for them. Because some of these people get so intense that unless something happens chemically to slow them down, they snap and become what is known as psychotic. And when you become psychotic, now we talk in AA sometimes about, well, I'm psychotic and I'm over it and I got psychotic again over it. That isn't the way it really is. True psychosis, once you become psychotic, the chances are just about 99 and 9 tenths to that you're going to stay psychotic. That's a condition that stays. And what there's a lot of ramifications of psychosis, but probably as good as, as any, to put it in a nutshell, is that your brain, under sufficient intense conflict, it can find no way out of it, will make reality look different than it is to resolve the conflict. To, sometimes in some people it's just a rifle, just one thing they'll see differently. Some people see the whole thing differently, but they're, they're quite obvious. And that's why these people are given sedations to keep from them getting to that point. And uh, here's another funny thing. Alcoholics almost never become psychotic. The cases of alcoholics becoming psychotic are... Slim and none. Now, doesn't that sound strange? Because we all know that the alcoholism is the second greatest cause of insanity. But not from that. Alcoholic insanity is when you've used enough alcohol to remedy your emotions that it begins to dry out and desiccate your brain cells. Most of you, I am sure, have never seen a case of alcoholic insanity. I see them almost every day. And I wish I'd never see any. Because people with alcoholic insanity don't sit in AA meetings and talk silly. And they don't act funny and say ridiculous things. They sit in a chair and people come and change their diapers three times a day. And they feed them and put them to bed and get them up and feed them and change their diapers. And they can never get better because brain cells do not revive. And they... Uh, it's very similar to the last stages of syphilis, except for one thing. Syphilis has the decency to kill the patient. In alcoholic insanity, you can sit like that for 40 years, perfectly healthy. You just don't know who you are or where you are. But alcoholics almost never become psychotic. Isn't that strange? Why? Because when, when the conflict gets bad enough, long enough, they... Drink alcohol. <laughs> now you say, why don't these goofy neurotics drink alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> and many of them do. But in 93% of the people or thereabouts, drinking alcohol doesn't change it. That's what makes an alcoholic. Alcohol alters the perception of reality in some people. A case, if we wanted to talk about it, a case could be made that alcohol, you and I have the ability to induce temporary psychosis. Because when I drink alcohol, I make things look different. My relationship to my environment changes. I get taller and more self-contained, and they get smaller and less frightening to me. Alcohol fills my holes. And that's, uh, I think that's one of the great reasons that people like you and me can say something I never wanted to say in my early years of sobriety, but I am so grateful today that I'm an alcoholic. Because by God, at least there's something I can do. And most, as the New England philosopher says, most people live their lives in quiet desperation. 99% of people live their lives in quiet desperation. And you and I have lived much of our lives in quiet desperation. And we'll do it in little increments from now on. And there's a way out. It's called AA for people like you and me. And it's just amazing because I mentioned this the other night in Oakland, that we live in the less than 1% of human history 
when there has been an answer for our problem. Just think, in 1932, a great many people in this auditorium today were living in 1932. Not you, Tim. <laughs> Young snot. But a great many people were living in 1932. And in 1932, as you know by reading the AA literature, a very wealthy family had money as much as they could spend, and they sent their son, an intelligent, a wonderful young man who had a terrible drinking problem, sent him to the best doctor in the world, Dr. Carl Jung in Europe. And Dr. Carl Jung examined this man, the leading doctor and psychiatrist in the world, circa 1932, and he said, Roland, I have some bad news for you. You suffer from what is called alcoholism. And there is no known answer in the world today. There are a number of people who try to have therapies, the drying out facilities, the cures, but there is no answer. They don't work. And I'm afraid I must tell you, you must look forward to a long and painful death. And I would do anything I could to help you, but I can't. Now, that was in my lifetime, and many of your lifetime. This is not something that just uh, has been here all along. And in 1935, two guys got together and founded AA. They didn't know they were founding AA. They were trying to save their butt, and they called in a third guy in a hospital. And uh, it's a funny thing, you know. We were talking about this uh, this morning. We think so often about these early people in AA as some sort of devoted, dedicated, wonderful people living in an aura of sacrifice and nobility, and they were just like you and me. A couple of years ago, I was sitting in Houston, I guess, talking to Dr. Bob's son. And I said, that must have been a wonderful experience, being present as a teenager at the birth of the greatest social and spiritual movement of the 20th century. He said, he thought it was a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So every time I want to bring every time I want to bring a girl home, there'd be some new drunk in the living room. <laughs> he said, I said, Ma, can't uh, I'm glad Dad is sober, but Jesus, you know, couldn't he do that down to his office or something? <laughs> well, he got God got revenge on him. Now it's 40 years later, and he's a member of Al-Anon. <laughs> he married some alcoholic broad who just taught him a lesson or two. <laughs> yeah. But that is funny, you know. And uh, Bill and his wife sound like two wonderful people, but that was a terrible life, you know. She was working in a store as a clerk, and... He wasn't working, couldn't get a job, and he'd keep bringing home these guys, and they would steal things and sell them, and just terrible. And in fact, he was ready to drink again. I, uh, she, exp she, he said to her, he said, uh, gee, Lois, this experience I thought I had in Towns Hospital, uh, I thought it was some wonderful thing, but I guess it didn't, it was maybe just a psychotic experience. I just, because everybody I've tried to help has gotten drunk for 10 months. Everybody I've tried to help has got drunk. It isn't working at all. And she came up with the, probably the only answer that would have saved him and thereby saved you and me to be in Corte Madera this afternoon. And I asked her once, I said, how in the world did you ever think of that answer? What an inspiring answer. She didn't even think of it. It just seemed so obvious. I didn't see why Bill didn't see it. She said, it must be working, Bill, when you try to help these people, this is the first time you've ever stayed sober, 10 months. And there's a great lesson there, too. Because a lot of us who have been sponsors and tried to be sponsors get very discouraged when the people we are helping don't become wonderful. <laughs> she wasn't looking, it's all right. And uh, you get discouraged. And one of the saddest things I know when I hear in AA, people say, oh, I don't try to help me. My, my strength is in other fields. I, I don't seem to carry the message. I carry the disease. 
And we all have felt that way. But I'm just telling you, the steps don't say that you work in service. That's fine to do that. But you try to carry the message to alcoholics because that's what saves your bacon. Whether they get sober or not is extraneous. But all these AAs grown. We live in this 1% of human history where there's an answer. AA is successful everywhere in America. Most of the world. Fran S. has brought it to Soviet Russia. Increased their drinking considerably. <laughs> Fran, Fran makes two more trips out over there. They're going to pull out of Afghanistan. <laughs> so, you know. So alcoholism isn't really a problem anymore like it used to be. It's just kind of an inconvenience now. Do you want to do something about it? And isn't it strange with all of the Alcoholics Anonymous all over, in addition to that, backed up by hospitals and treatment centers who developed a tremendous interest in this field as soon as insurance money became available? <laughs> I'm not putting it down. I'm just... I also know that from my friends in Washington that the insurance companies are getting very cross at the corporate level with the amount of return visits done on their insurance. And they are, you can look in the next year or two or three to a policy that's going to have only outpatient treatment on insurance. No more pay in the 10 grand a week or whatever they pay. So if you're, gonna, if you're planning on being goofy, get it in soon. <laughs> but with all the detoxes and hospitals, in addition to AA, there's no need for any alcoholic to ever have any sustained problem again. And that's why we have to remember that today, with all of the facilities available, today, 95 alcoholics out of 100 in America die drunk. And most of them die drunk because they cannot accept the name of what they've got. And I'll tell you something else that's safe to say in any AA group. A number of people in this room today, sober and sane and safe, will die drunk. That sounds terribly negative. It isn't because AA doesn't work. I'm not trying to frighten you. But it's just the nature of the beast. Because people like you and me have a tendency, when left to our own devices, to keep thinking of alcoholism as some acute illness that we have cured and gotten away from. Like bulbar polio get over boy I almost died but they brought me out of it and now I'm okay and that isn't the way it is it's hard to remember that alcoholism is very similar to advanced diabetes for example where you can be pulled back by the brink of death and restored to health in some cases only as long as you continue to take the insulin but if you stop taking insulin it doesn't matter how long you've been recovered you go back to where you were. And that's what alcoholism is. But our minds would like to tell us differently. I'm okay. I see people die from alcoholism every day. And I want to rush out and grab them and say, Jesus, you don't have to. You don't have to die. You don't have to live like this. There's an answer and I, I'll tell you about it. And I'll go to the wall with you. And it makes me so cross that they will not accept it. And then I have to stop and remember. I'm pretty smart. I've got a good education. I've got a keen mind. And I want to do what's right for me. And I slipped for nine years in AA. And I didn't succeed till they all stopped trying to help me. If I'd have found two more people to love me, I'd have been dead. <laughs> I found I shouldn't say that because I, a guy loved me. But as Mary talked about, he loved me in a way that did not include my decision-making as part of the love process. He just said, here's what you do. And I always want to sit down with folks and reason. And he didn't want to reason, the old fool. If he had a reason, I'd have had him. And John Barleycorn would have had me. But uh, I dr the worst years of my life came after I came to AA. I, after I came to, I felt bad when I came to because I'd been in jail two or three times. That was not the image I wanted to project as a young executive on the way up.
After coming to AA, I went to jail 32 times. Before I came to AA, I was in a veterans hospital once in the winter of 1946 for nerves. After coming to AA, I went to veterans hospitals and city hospitals and county hospitals, wound up one day finding myself committed for an indefinite to life in the Texas State Insane Asylum in Big Spring, Texas. Now, I'll tell you, when you're a young guy trying to hold it together and you've got a family and you want everything to be right, and you find yourself being committed for an indefinite to life to the Texas State Insane Asylum, you have an intuitive feeling this is going to look like hell on your resume. It just... <laughs> it just... It just... It's really hard to weave that in, you know. Uh, what'd you do that next 40 years? Well, uh, self-employed. And I went right. I went right to the end with it. I went. Finally, lost my family. Finally, lost my home. Finally, lost my occupation. Finally, lost my car. In fact. About the last job I had, one of the truly embarrassing situations, worse than jail, is when you're on a job trying to wheel and deal, and GMAC comes in and gets the keys to your car. Okay, you, Emerson, give us the keys to the goddamn car. You're four payments behind. <laughs> Here you are. I guess they want to tune it up. And then I got uh, my teeth kicked out and the floor of the Phoenix trunk tank. I've often thought about that. You, you can get new families. You can get new homes. You can get new occupations. You can get new starts. But it's like our book says. We're like men who have lost their teeth. We never grow new ones. <laughs> and I wound up... Uh, in an old t-shirt, an old pair of pants, and a pair of tennies, and no front teeth, being 86th out of a skid row mission in Los Angeles. And I try to explain, but I'm not a bum. I didn't say quite that clearly. But I'm not a bum. <laughs> I wanted to explain to him, I, I'm an award-winning writer. I got awards. I, a couple of years ago, I directed the Grand Opera at the University of Texas, won awards all over the world. I... I've done so many things. I'm a talented man. I, but I was having a little trouble with my consonants. Phil. <laughs> so I finally just wanted to say, I'll get to you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and that morning it was raining, and I walked 91 blocks out to the AA club on Wilshire and Fairfax, and the guy wasn't going to let me in. He said, you're banned out of the AA club. Banned out of the AA club. He says, you stole the coffee money a couple of weeks ago. It's the Friday night meeting, remember? I said, oh, yes, I remember that now, yeah? <laughs> I guess I had a little flip. Because I always knew how to act like an alcoholic, even if I wasn't one. He says, you don't act like an alcoholic. You'd have a slip. You're just a phony son of a bitch, and you make me sick, and you make the people in this club sick. I thought, I guess you're right, Tom. But I thought, Someday, I'm going to take some hot pliers and pull out your fingernails. <laughs> and then laugh. So just go in the back room. Don't anybody know I let you in because you make, you make me look bad. Just get in there and get out of sight. I said, God bless you, Tom. <laughs> but I thought I'm going to take those hot fingernails and stick them in your eye. And, just... and then I'll do a tap dance. And I uh, went back there and I thought, Jesus, this is, can't be happening. I thought it's, the reason I was in the Texas Nut House was because I I'd, I'd, had committed suicide. And the guy bro found me and brought me back to life in time and put me in there. The only way I got out of that Nut House was pretending to be an alcoholic. And I'd been around eight. Because I, uh, I was in there as a suicide. I hadn't had a drink for some time before my suicide. That's why I knew I was an alcoholic. That's why, because... Alcoholics have problems when they drink. When I don't drink too long, it all goes up. And I remember standing, sitting there thinking, feeling so bad, hot, sick, 
desperate, smelled bad, and I, even the AAs were rejecting me. And I remember, I remember thinking, it sounds funny now, but it wasn't funny at all. I remember thinking, maybe my suicide attempt was successful. Maybe this is just the way it's going to be for eternity. Just one thing after another, after another, after another. And I, uh, the way I beat that nuthouse in Texas, I pretended to be an alcoholic and played their sick little game till I got out of there. I, uh, I was really quite dreadful. I, uh, I was, well, I was there a short time. And, uh, I might have still been there because I was so depressed. I thought, this is the end of my career. And uh, <laughs> some guy said, don't ever try to escape from here. Escape from hospital. I said, oh, is it? And my heart started for the first time in a couple of weeks. And then shortly after that, I found a way to get through a door and down a corridor and through another door and across the yard and over the fence. <laughs> the fox was loose in West Texas. And then I made that terrible discovery. What he said was true. It's an escape-proof hospital. But you don't know until you get out. Did you? But if you've ever been in West Texas, you suddenly realize they can see you running for three days. Then... <laughs> <laughs> and you feel like such a dumbbell in your white bathrobe out there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a matter of time till the field glasses pick you up, you know. Well, there goes that little Yankee son bitch now. <laughs> he snatched me back and gave me an autumn full of electric shock treatments for that. And when you've had an autumn full of electric shock treatments, you never run much after that. You just... Do you remember my name? I don't. <laughs> Could it be Hart, Scheffner, and Marx? <laughs> and when I got through that, they... I, I had to transfer that alcoholic ward because I was desperate. I knew that. And I saw that an alcoholic ward in Ward 9. My memory came back, and there was an old guy named Mr. Ross. I got to hustle this old son of a bitch. And he would come through our ward. I'd say, Mr. Ross, I said one day, Mr. Ross, I, I'm here on a suicide commitment, but my problem has always been alcohol. When I don't drink, I'm happy and contented, but I have a terrible need to drink sometimes, an obsession I can't control. And when I drink, it's as though the drinking requires more drinking, and I lose control and everything goes, to, and I'm willing to go to any length. Do you have some sort of an answer to a problem like this? I'll, do you have any literature I could read? Is there any meetings I could go to? I, if I could just find a God that I've lost in the bottle. <laughs> and his eyes went... <clears throat> Poor old man had never seen a sincere newcomer. <laughs> and they transferred me to the alcoholic ward. I was the best patient they ever had in that hospital. I, everybody else was committed there by their families for 30 days. They were going to stay 30 days and go home. That was the program in the 1950s. And I was there till I got better. But I got to be secretary of the group as they came and went. And I got, Christ, I got to be a big man on the hospital in the AA program. I thought, and these guys said they didn't want to be there. You'd sit next to a guy and say, what are you going to do to get out of here, Fred? I'm going to kill that bitch. <laughs> you know. <there> was. <laughs> Old Mr. Ross would give us lectures. Maybe they still do it in hospitals. You know. Well, boys, today we're going to talk about the 12 steps for an hour. Everybody, oh, jeez. <laughs> but I had to look interested. They're going to go home anyway with Oh, good, Mr. Ross. <laughs> and you'd get all done with an hour of this. It just, your hair would be sleeping. Just, just. <laughs> That's what happened. It was still back there sleeping. I forgot to pick it up. He said, are there any questions? Nobody had any questions. Can you tell us some more, Mr. Ross, about the fourth and fifth step? How we, how we get this garbage out of our systems and on the paper and share it with another human being to find release? Can you tell us about that in detail, Mr. Ross? <laughs> He'd say, yes, I can. <laughs> and the whole rest of the room would say, oh, shit. <laughs> but I couldn't be concerned with them. I had to have him. And I finally got out of that hospital on that basis. And the funny thing is, I never had another drink. Until I ran out of Thorazine. 
and I knew I I knew I had to do the same thing in Los Angeles. So I played their sick little game in that AA club. And I said, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. I always got a sponsor, wherever I was around AA briefly, because it looks good to have a sponsor. <laughs> and I'll tell you how you get a sponsor. Try to find someone who says things like, I have non-judgmental love. I love you just as you are. You need not change for me. Perhaps if our paths come together, we can walk side by side. Not I ahead of you, nor I behind you, but together, Sherry. Go up to him, I'll tell you fast. Will you be my sponsor? But I'll tell you, even guys like that, you got to stay away from. Because they claim to be non-judgmental, but after a while they all get goddamn judgmental. <laughs> well, what's wrong with you, boy? You know. So you just stay away from them. Just use them as your sponsor. When people say, Who, "Who's your sponsor?" Al's my sponsor, the old timer. <laughs> <laughs> but the only time you ever called such a sponsor is two in the morning or so, and you say, "Hello, hello, Fred." I'm afraid I've let you and AA down. I drank. Now, if you've got a loving sponsor, you say, you haven't let us down. You've done nothing wrong. You're sick and you've had a relapse. That's all. I'm coming right over and we're going to get you through this. I'll get some of the other guys and we'll sit up with you all night. If you need a few bucks, let me know. It's nothing. It's part of it. You're going to get better, son. Now, that's what I call a sponsor. I got a hold of some old puke in Los Angeles that knew nothing about sponsorship. <laughs> Jesus. He was an actor. I thought he'd have a little class, but he, had, he was a bad actor and a bad sponsor. And he'd say things to me like, Call me anytime you want to, kid. Day or night. If it's late at night, it better be important. But call me anytime you want to, up till the time you drink. If you ever take a drink, don't call me. Because all you're going to hear from me is a click and a dial tone. Uh, Jesus Christ. A bunch of pukes in California, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I had no place to live. And somebody suggested I live in an abandoned car for a night. And I did. And I lived there for six more months. I said to my sponsor, Jesus Christ, Bob. I'm not an animal. I'm living in that car up there, me, living from hand to mouth and cold. I'm eating cake and goddamn meetings. I'm a sensitive, intelligent guy, Bob. What am I going to do? What shall I do? He said, get a job. <laughs> I said, look how terrible I look. He said, uh, Get a terrible job. <laughs> That's not love, folks. Well, I had a terrible time, and I did things this old puke said and did, and just to keep off my case, and just hit it. I got fired off a job after job because of my stinking attitude. I had a job as a furniture mover. I lasted till noon on that job. And a guy said to me, Hey, yo, without the teeth, you bumped my lamp. And I was feeling sensitive that day, and I, I said, no, you're mistaken. I broke your goddamn life, you know. Uh, I got a job as a janitor in a jewelry store, and the guy, he was an AA guy, and he fired me right before Christmas because he felt I was dusting too long amongst the watches, you know. And I thought I was, I thought I was going to have a new year in Seattle saying, See anything you like? <laughs> I got fired as a dishwasher at the Daily Delicatessen. Lasted two and a half days there until I began to realize that the busboys were bringing in more dishes than that restaurant was using. <laughs> Which led me to deduce they were getting them from other restaurants to humiliate <laughs> No. And I got fired, and I, uh, AA has no steps to cover when you're being screwed by life, I'll tell you that. 
And my sponsor talked to me about a week before that. He says, shouldn't you take, shouldn't you take your inventory? And I tried to explain to him. I've been in psychoanalysis for thousands and thousands of dollars worth with professionals. I know a great deal about my insides and my past. The inventory step may work fine for AAs who need some rudimentary understanding. But I've done it with professionals. And I uh, don't think I need an inventory, but thanks. <laughs> well, the day I got fired as a dishwasher, I thought, God damn it, here I am, six months sober, living in the back seat of an abandoned car, no front teeth, have a few clothes that some mopes gave me, a jacket that doesn't fit, unless I carry one shoulder up like that. <laughs> Well, see that handicapped guy? Yeah, but isn't that a pretty jacket he's got on? <laughs> yeah. Just. And I decided to kill myself. Because that's, if you can't drink, I don't want to look bad to my sponsor and drink. So I decided to kill myself. I didn't know quite how to get to the ocean, but I walked back down Sunset to La Cienega and across La Cienega over to Wilshire. I knew that went to the ocean. And I walked and walked and walked, kind of a tragic Hamlet-like figure. Maybe you've done that. When you're really feeling depressed and you walk down the street and you just, and you just know that people are saying, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what a terrible load that man must carry. <laughs> and it turns out later what they're saying is, see that asshole? You know. That's... But I walked and I could not find the ocean. I could, and I couldn't believe it. I stopped in the gas station. I said, where's the ocean? He says, you're just in the western end of Beverly Hills, kid. You had to go out past the Veterans Hospital, then about another five miles. <laughs> I don't mind killing myself. I'm not going to walk <laughs> five more miles to do it. So I'd walked into my sponsor's toll zone, cut it down to call to a dime. And I called him up. Hey, Bob. And I decided, he is such a hard man. I'm going to... I'm a good writer. I've made a good living most of my life when I've been able to as a writer. I'm going to give this guy the saddest story that no one could say no to. It'll, it'll take his heart of stone and make it bleed red. I said, Bob. He said, why aren't you working? I said, Bob, now let me, let me tell you something, Bob. <laughs> I'm not complaining about my children I've lost that I'll never see again. I'm not complaining about my family or my mother and father who've written me off, never write. I'm not complaining about the fact that I lost my jobs and my life is over. That's all right, Bob. I can handle that. But there's something I don't think you know, Bob. You know, even in AA, people treat me differently. I'm not... You say about how you were... I hear you talk about how you were accepted in AA. They don't accept me, Bob. I go in the club and they... They won't call on me in participation meetings. They... I sit down and have a cup of coffee with somebody, and they get up and go to a different table. And people, they, when they go to parties, they tell each other not to tell me. And uh, <laughs> everybody has a friend, and I don't have a friend, Bob. And, and I'm alone and desperate, Bob, and I'm doing the best I can, but nobody cares. And it suddenly struck me, this is true. Holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> The worst story I could think of was mine, Jesus. And I burst into tears. <laughs> I said, what am I going to do, Bob? What am I going to do? He says, why don't you write your goddamn inventory the way I told you? And I said, why don't you? I forget what I asked him now. it had been fun to watch him try it. But I... Uh, I said, Bob, in my judgment, Bob, that's the last thing in the world. I can... I'm burdened with remorse and sadness and sickness and despair. And in my judgment, taking an inventory will make me crazy, Bob. He said, in your judgment? Who cares about your judgment? You live in an abandoned car, for Christ's sake. He said, if I wanted your judgment, I'd go down and put my head in the back window and ask you for it. <laughs> so I'm living in a big house in Pacific Palisades. Who gives a shit what you think? <laughs> I'll tell you, I was staggered. 
I've had cruelty, but that's just about the acme. I thought to myself, if I just had the money, if I just had the money, I thought, I would call up the World Service Office in New York and just tell them, I just want you to know there's an old timer in Los Angeles killing newcomers. <laughs> and I'll tell you his name and address. Now it's, uh, now it's 27 years later, and I find myself in a different mode. When I talk to the World Service Office in New York, I say, no, I'm not. <laughs> Looks a little different from this side. But that day he got me so upset I wrote an inventory. And it was so... It was just dreadful, and I was so out of it that I wrote things in which I wasn't the hero, and uh, just terrible. And I don't know if it made me feel any better. I survived the day anyway, and I stuck it away. And a couple weeks later, I was ready to kill myself again, and he made me ride with him in his car from Los Angeles to Oxnard. And I read it to him at night. With a, he drove, and I had a flashlight, and I read it to him. And uh, I thought, Jesus. I started a couple of times, halt, not to, I'd scan the next prayer. I better not read this. Just read it, read it. Yeah. And we got up in your office, and I thought, boy, he's going to throw me out of his car. And I looked over to him, and the old fool was going. <laughs> and I thought, the old son of a bitch is snapped. He's never heard data like this, I'll bet. <laughs> but since then, I have been up that road maybe 250 times under the driver's seat. And uh, someone else sitting over there. And I'm a much better listener than my sponsor. When I get near Oxnard, I always turn my head. Because <sighs> there's only so many things you can... The only exciting trip I ever made is when Mary rode with me once. And, really, Mary? Get out of my car, you bitch! But you know, I, uh, there's only inventories are only seem obsessive to the first day. When you've heard a few inventories, there's nothing new in any of them. The details vary, but it's always the same erosion of self. In fact, sometimes when you start to hear an inventory after a while, you know where it's going. It's hard to wait without to listen to it be read. And you, sometimes you can tell when things have been left out. And you say, Didn't you leave something out there? <laughs> Did that bitch call you? No? And a lot of people want to explain. Now, what I'm about to read you, let me explain it a little bit. You see, it isn't quite the way it sounds. It's a. Uh, uh, oh, just read it for Christ's sake and shut up! But I know that that day, I guess, I took the most important step in AA. What was it? The fifth step? No. The third step. I did something that I was unalterably opposed to doing because that was the action called for. I allowed a power greater than myself to superimpose over mine. Turning your will and your life over to the care of God, in my opinion, does not consist of mouthing pretty prayers while you go off to do what you want to do. It's allowing AA and its practitioners to superimpose different ways to do things. Because the only thing different about AA than anything else it's something to think about, you know. Almost every therapy in the world, forever and even today, says this. You come to us, we will change your thinking, and eventually your actions will change. AA is the only therapy that I know of, it was for many, many years, that says just the opposite. You come to us, we will change your actions and eventually your thinking will change. Someone was wise enough to discover we, can't, we haven't got time to wait for our thinking to get better. We, uh, we're going to have a lot going before then, you know. Now, it's a new tenant in mental health, 
the new thing they're introducing at UCLA and other big universities. It's a big thing called behavioral modification, where they take people, and they don't care how they think, but they change their actions, and they're finding some degree of getting better. They say, look what we have discovered. And we all go, oh, because that's what AA is about, behavioral modification. And in so changing your behavior that eventually your thinking changes. And when your thinking changes, your self-worth changes. And your ability to identify and begin to fill the holes in your psyche that have been so intolerable. And the knowledge of beginning to understand that you are not as different as you have always secretly been terrified that you were. And continuing to do these things little by little. Hopefully coming to, for people like me, perhaps like some of you, get to a point where you are now willing to make yourself available to God because you no longer feel unalterably stained. I was raised in a very strict church, and all of my life I couldn't stand God because I was too sinful. We were talking about that the other night. You know, I said, my life I've broken all the Ten Commandments in the Norwegian Lutheran Church, but if you break three, you're gone. And I've broken all ten. How do I get back in? And I suddenly remembered, I haven't broken all ten. There's one part of one I haven't broken. And I've used that as a beachhead, like going ashore at Iwo. And Because as of tonight, this afternoon, I have never coveted my neighbor's manservant. Not much, but it's... But I've come to believe in God. And this is from a guy who could not stand church, to a Norwegian Lutheran church, certainly for 30 years and never went near one and wouldn't anybody around me were near one. My wife, I married a Catholic girl. I wouldn't let her have our children baptized. I refused to let them baptize in that corny goddamn church till our little son died. And then, fortunately, my wife had great presence of mind. A little baby in the crib. She rushed to the kitchen. I was, out, I was in jail drunk. She rushed to the kitchen, got a handful of water and baptized. And that's the only thing that saved her sanity. And then, and then I'd begrudgingly let them have take it to be baptized, but I don't want to know about it. And on and on. And Wednesday of this week, as I've done a number of times, I sat in the Norwegian Lutheran Church with my mother. I've sat there with her many times. This time with the cats. At peace and think, isn't that nice? God is here and God is in the group I'm going to in AA tonight. And God is in the hills and the trees. And I have come to the conclusion that God means, God wants good for me. And it is only me that stands in the way. I don't think some metaphysical way. I mean really means good for me. I think God means good for everybody. If I thought God picked and chose, I would think he would not choose me. <laughs> but I have to believe that God has the same thing for all of us. And somehow, through AA, we are able to turn it on a little bit, people like me. But I'm not here to tell you that God will make you whole if you're new and cynical. The higher power that saved my life was my sponsor. Because he was all I could believe in at that moment. As a result, of that, I came to believe in A and came to believe in God. But I'm not telling you to believe in what I believe in. I'm telling you that you better find something to believe in that you can believe in now. No matter how it looks to somebody else, believe in what you can believe in. Because it gets to be 2 o'clock in the morning sometimes, and you've got to turn to what you believe in. And if you've been shucking them, you're going to die. You better have something. But the nice thing about it all, is all the knowledge about... I, I started off this afternoon in kind of a pseudo-scientific analysis of alcoholism, which I think is important only if you start thinking, well, now I'm well, I can go do it again. You can't. Once you, you become sensitive to it, you're gone. It's just, again, like a diabetic saying, I've been feeling well for three years, I can now eat my sugar. You cannot because it has an unusual effect on you. and you, But you will if you do not take the 
insulin called Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the human mind has a tendency to take things for granted. Any one of us have, have had many moments in our life, if we could just say, if I could just, Jesus, spend a day without under, being under terrible pressure. Yet you get days after all that under pressure, so what? I don't have my car I wanted. On and on. Don't have the job. The one I love belongs to somebody else. All the horse shit that goes into making up a human being. And that's why people like me, and I presume like you, need to continue to go to AA. I haven't... It's not to get new data. I haven't heard anything new in 20 years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I haven't heard a new thing in 20 years. And yet the same things keep centering me again and again. Mary, your speaker a little earlier today, one of the things I've always admired about her, she goes to meetings and meetings, and I go to meetings and meetings, and I'm around to listen to the 3 o'clock in the morning calls of people who were too well to go to meetings and were too busy. And after a while, you just want to say, call me in the daytime. You don't want to call me in the daytime before? Call me in the daytime now. I really do not want to hear the reason you slipped again this time. Tell it to somebody who's interested. Because the concept of Alcoholics Anonymous is to band together, to share our, as you say in your thing here, experience, strength, and hope that we may find a way to alter our actions that will eventually change our thinking, that will help us to understand, to keep changing those actions, to keep changing those thinking. So we need not induce temporary psychosis to stand reality. And if you don't choose to take these actions, and if you don't choose to change your thinking, and you want to play your sick little metaphysical self-hypnosis game, go play it. But then take what comes with it. Lay face down in your own puke. Go back to the hopelessness and despair. A new guy doesn't know any better. Maybe if they're once or twice. But the people who make an occupation out of being slippers, they get more attention for being drunk than they do for getting sober. Screw up. We are here to stay sober, not to get sober. That's what we got to do. And that's why we got to extend the best we got. We got to do the best we can. I was thinking about that today. I resented coming here today because through a mix up in my schedule, there are 250 people at my house having a softball tournament this afternoon, and I'm the captain of the host team. <laughs> Don't worry, my team shipped together to make sure I made the trip. <laughs> but I'll tell you, my whole house and backyard is full of maybe 350 people. And they're all having fun and playing games, having fun. And I thought, oh, God damn it, i got to go to court of Madeira. I could have been, been a champion pitching flawlessly. But there isn't even a doubt because I wouldn't have a yard to meet in if I didn't go to AA. I wouldn't have my grandchildren there. I wouldn't have my wife. I wouldn't have my children. I wouldn't have anything. I, but more important than that, I wouldn't have my sanity. I wouldn't have a moment's goddamn peace in the world. So that's what we're here for. We share our experience, strength, and hope. Do what you got to do and keep doing it. So as Mary said, you can walk through your life with some degree of dignity and self-worth and reason for being. And when you can do that, it's all worthwhile. Thank you.